here, this is the Twitter chat, you know, join us and you can link back to this, you know, Google Hangout. So even when they're in the middle of it or something. And see exactly, where, exactly. Where All right, so we are live on the Google Hangout. Ivana Taylor here. Welcome to Bizapalooza Chat. I am your host, and today's Bizapalooza Chat is sponsored by your friends at the Canon Maxify line of printers. Love my Canon. Love it. Okay, so today's show is all about how to establish trust with prospects and customers at a time when distrust and skepticism is at an all-time high. So if you're trying to sell anything to anyone, you're dealing with a new kind of customer and one that listens less, questions more, and trusts no one so think about that. How many times have you heard people say that in order to be successful, you have to have people know, like, and trust you? Well, what does it take to do that? Because they really don't. So I had questions, I needed answers, and anything that has to do with trust, credibility, and business, there's only one place to go, Dunn and Bradstreet. So I go to my friend, Dustin Luther from Dunn and Bradstreet. He is the director of engagement over there. and. You guys are the people to go to, right? <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot to be said for the the, the DMB data for sure. Um, so how long has DMB been around, Dustin? How does that? How does? Oh wait, I, I forgot to do something. So yo, folks, if you're okay. watching this, you want to participate? Hashtag Bizapalooza Chat over on Twitter. We'll be there chatting it up while Dustin and I are chatting. We're right here on the video. So Dustin, why yes. is trust important? What does trust have to do with anything? So, you know, trust is so critical in the business world, uh, well, in personal life too, <laughs> in terms of relationships. But, um, you know, in the business world, there's, there's no doubt that, you know, you, people want to do business with people they trust. You lose trust, you lose business, you lose credibility, um, you know, you can lose contracts. Uh, there, there's no real surprise there that trust is just a, a, a real key element of that. Um, and so, you know, how do you go about building it is I think a lot of what we'll talk about today, right? Like what are some, some ways that people can, can come in and, you know, not only, I guess there's, there's building trust with your, your potential customers, your suppliers, your vendors, um, with your other partners that you might do business with. And then there's, there's building trust, um, almost how do you go into a relationship knowing that you, you can trust somebody. And that's where, you know, analytics and data and, and DMB data, that kind of thing can, can really play a big role. So I'm really embarrassed to admit this to you, Dustin, but it has been like a million years since I've had anything to do with DMB from the supplier side. Can you, and you guys have changed and evolved so much. So tell us a little bit about like, what is done in Bradstreet? What's going on over there? How does a small business use done in Bradstreet? Well, it's a, it's a great question. So um, I work for a team that we that really helps within the small and medium sized business at, at Dun and Bradstreet. Um, they've there's kind of a different there is a different group that really focuses on a lot of the more corporate and enterprise customers. But but my team goes out to a lot of small business events. We're out doing online events, really talking to the small business community. Um, and really trying to educate them because the questions you ask and the you know where you're coming from they're utterly valid and and super common. Um, you know a lot of the things I end up going to are around government contracting. Uh, there is a, a critical component that DNB can play there. Uh, so what will happen is that somebody will be told like to get your app in the app store you need a Duns number or to get a government contract you're going to need to have a Duns number you know in addition to other things you, you might have to do that what becomes one kind of component and a lot of people will sign up for a Duns number they're free um, if you may already even have one there's a good chance if you've been in business for a while that your business has a Duns number because um, they can just be issued based on you know a whole plethora of of, of ways um, and so you know, they've got a Dunn's number, but they don't necessarily realize what that means. And, and you know, for business, that means that a business credit file has been created. And now DMB is tracking, you know, business activity. Um, what type of payments are you getting? What type of payments are you making? What's the terms on those? Are you paying on time? Are you getting paid on time? Those kinds of questions become one component. You know, if there were liens or judgments or other government kind of legal issues, that stuff can all be in a, in, within a DMB file. So it kind of operates like a personal credit, you know, file, but for the business itself. That's so what I when thought. that's what I thought, I'm so proud of myself because I was like, it, it, well, Dustin, is it like a big brothery kind of thing? 
you know, it's not really a big brother in the sense, I mean, there's, there's, you know, your perspectives are, are all over the place, right? But the, you know, on, on a lot of levels, having a business, if they want to go in and have a contract with somebody. So, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try to keep out the huge vendors, you know, keep them nameless, but you know them, the huge retailers of right. the world. They will often require that a company has a DUNS number in order to, let's say, apply to be a vendor or a supplier. You know, you want to go into one of the big auto retailers around the country, they're likely going to require that you have a DUNS number just to submit your widget or, or whatever it is you, you want to kind of bring into their, their system. So they're going to look at your business credit file and if they see that, you know, this the biggest contract that this company has is for five thousand dollars a year right they're probably gonna go we're not gonna give you a five million dollar contract right so they can't i mean I'm, I'm making numbers up super generalizations but that's it, it's used in all kinds of ways that help business owners kind of understand like this is how i should do business with somebody else um and so for small business owners, that can be really critical, especially if they don't necessarily understand it. So somebody might have applied for a lot of government contracts, not been getting really any feedback and doesn't understand that they're, they're applying for stuff, but their, their DMB business credit file is empty or it's, it's nearly empty and it's not really robust. And they're applying for contracts that look huge that somebody pulls a business credit file and says, you know, you don't necessarily, you know, you don't, you, you don't necessarily look like you can handle that much work. Um, or they go for a big bank loan for their business and the banks will look and they'll pull the, the you know, DMB file and go, yeah, you know, you, you say you can do, you've got a contract that, you know, you might be able to do $20 million a year, but it doesn't show that that, you know, in your DMB file, that can be an element where, you know, we talk about trust and credibility. It's one of these that could raise questions for somebody who might want to do business with you. Um, and vice versa, small businesses can do that when they want to do business with someone else. Like, can this company really deliver? Um, I tell a story a lot of when I was an engineer back before I got into marketing. And the story is that I used to get contracts. I used to do a lot of traffic impact analysis studies for different uh, developers. And that was when you're a young engineer, you're getting started. We, but they were often developers who had you know, no or, or bad business credit. And so before we could do any business with them, our, um, our accountant, we had only one, it was a relatively small engineering company, had one accountant, she would pull their DUNS file and she would tell me how I, what terms I could give to that developer. So it would be, you gotta work, you can work with them of course, but it's 100% retainer. Or if they had a great file, maybe 25% reta retainer we can negotiate down to. I, as an engineer, you know, who was managing the contract even, I didn't have a lot of say over that. I didn't even understand what the DMB file necessarily meant at the time. I just knew she was looking up DMB. She told me what I could offer. So, you know, and how I could do business with this person. So DMB gets used all the time and it's just a good check to help businesses to understand, you know, yeah, how do I want to contract with this other, with this other entity? So that brings another question that I never even thought about asking until I heard this explanation. And that is, what can a small business do if your DUNS number is almost like a credit report? What can a small business do to build up their credibility? So there are all kinds of things, that, the ways that go in there um, in terms of building it up. I would rather not get into that because sometimes okay. it really depends on the different businesses. Uh, you know, so if you're a small supplier, it's very different than if you're a consulting firm, if you're so, ah, um, and there where do we people, go for info? Yeah. So I was going to say, so I would just recommend come to the small business portal we have on DNB. It's pretty easy to get to, and we'll actually tweet it out from our account right now. Great. It is B2B, the number two dot DNB.com. So it's kind of a little bit of a mouthful, but it's B2B.DNB.com. There's even a phone number on there. Somebody will. Uh, if you just called up and you don't even know your DUNS number, they'll be fine. They'll look up your information based on the city you're in and your company name or, or your name and kind of look around. Um, some people have, you know, multiple DUNS numbers because they've never really paid attention to it or just things are, are can, you know, if, you, if you're going, okay, I, I want to clean up my DUNS number, it's, it's pretty straightforward to do. That sounds like great advice. Can I ask one question that I know everyone is asking themselves right now? Is it going to take a long time? Do I need to slot like half a day to do this DUNS number thing? Um, you know, I really, it, it doesn't have to. It can, it can vary from, you know, really simple, come in and, and we even have, you know, free products uh, that somebody can come in. We've got a credit reporter 
that um, you can come in and you can start um, getting alerts on your the vendors you're working with or on your own business, like if something's changing your business. So you know it's not super in depth for the in depth report for kind of mm -hmm. I would say somewhat obvious reasons. We we charge for those, but you get sure. a nice overview that can just take a, a, a few minutes. Um, we also have concierge services, which some people with like larger contracts in particular that are, are really critical. So they might have it with a national retailer and they're like, I can't have my scores drop. If my, you know, something goes wrong here, I need to be alerted if something's, if something's showing up on my file that shouldn't be there or anything. So we have, we have a really cool team that can essentially handle it all for you. So, you know, it just depends if you, we also have do it yourself solutions where you get in there and, and manage your own business credit file. So there's everything from free up to, you know, we can really walk somebody through and, and, you know, handle a lot of the stuff for them. So it just depends on where somebody's at and, and what their needs are and, you know, kind of how they plan to leverage their business credit file into the future. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So Dustin, let's get into something a little bit higher contextual that I know you'll feel comfortable with. What is the difference between trust and credibility? What's the relationship between trust and credibility? You know, that's a great question. You had me, you know, uh, it's something to, to kind of dive into. Let's I think talk we, about it, right? Yeah, sure. So I'm not sure that I have like one quick answer, right? Part of me wants to say this is, is so dependent on each other, right? And part of me wants to say, you know, trust is one element of credibility. Um, and I'm not sure, I think I could probably make both arguments. <laughs> but uh, on a lot of levels, if you're a company out there and you're trying to build your credibility, the trust you have with your, whether it be vendors or suppliers or partners or customers or whoever you're working with, um, you know, that, that trust is so critical and such a critical kind of overall component of your credibility that I, I kind of want to slot it into there, right? And so, you know, what does it really mean to build trust? And, you know, I, I, I expect we'll dive into, you know, how do you lose trust and all those kinds of things, right? But, you know, it's, it's not like there's one thing. When I think of trust, I think of, you know, relationships you get with other people. So, you know, much of what I think of, especially in the kind of small business world, and, you know, I ran my own small business for a while, so I kind of remember that, but, you know, I've been in that world. It's, you know, the, the relationship with the various people at the companies, right? Like, how, how do they trust you? And if they trust you and they know you can handle the work or you're gonna, you know, you're gonna do what you've committed to doing, um, that's huge. And it's not trivial. And you kind of, in your intro, you mentioned just, you know, we live in a very cynical world, right? It's, it's easy to you gotta get so much information to go, I just don't know who to trust, right? And so everything from like, I think of like the online reviews, of course, Amazon being kind of a pioneer and really just making that something that's critical when you're talking about products. But I, it's rare that I go and buy something online and I don't, put a lot of trust in the various reviews. And if somebody's found to kind of uh, disrupt that uh, or cheat that system on, on their sites, you're gonna lose a lot of trust in them. So, so how do you kind of, how do you keep that trust so that, that you know, your customers and everyone really uh, continue to trust you? It's, it's, a, it's a great question and it's, it's not trivial. No, it's not at all. You know, it, it, I've done enough of these things where, you know, the most common thing you hear is, Oh, people do business, but they know, like, and trust, know, like, and trust. And I'm like, okay, right? There, there's, yep. I don't know. I, I kind of tend to look at it all as a space of uh, integrity. And integrity, not mm -hmm. just meaning uh, that I can believe you, but meaning, like, it all kind of works together. It doesn't fall apart, right? So trust is the integral component of any relationship, especially personal relationships, and then, you know, business is a relationship between multiple people. You know, like mm -hmm. I had to trust that you were gonna show up. <laughs> even though I knew you were in Alaska. <laughs> you know, you know. But, but there was yep. something about, but credibility, I think, maybe credibility adds to trust. Why did I know that you were gonna show up? Because every time I write to you, you respond. Every time mm -hmm. I do something, I get a response. And so I think I've been trained to trust you. Yeah. Oh, and there's there's a there's a lot to that. You had me thinking uh, as you're talking. There's there's so much to that element um, of trust and the slow. The, it, you know, it's it can be a slow process, right? I know myself. As I said, I, I'm one of those people. I would say that's quite cynical of of online things. Somebody makes a claim online, 
I don't want to trust it. Or, you know what I mean? Like I, my gut reaction is to not trust um, online, which isn't necessarily the best, but with other people, like you're saying with you, I know you're going to put a good program together. I know, you know, and, and you've built up that credibility online to, to do something like this. So it's your, your, everything you're saying there totally resonates with me. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I think that, um, I think what, well, of course we're in a political conversation right now. I'm in Ohio. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Cleveland, no less, right? So, I mean, the tenor <laughs> of everything is, I just don't believe anything. And of course, there's been so much research, especially with small business owners. They say that if a, if a brand is talking, they just don't believe them. Probably the most trustworthy people are other small business owners. So there's something about credibility and trust when it comes to how business owners talk to each other. Yeah, and it's, you know, there's so many ways you could go with that. I've been interviewing a lot of people for a new position I have open right now. I'm actually hiring a social media manager. And it ended up with so many conversations around candidates. And for better or worse, the people that I want tend to be people who've come to me through a recommendation. <laughs> and, right, like, and, and almost everybody I've ever hired has either started as like an intern with us, which is a very non committal way nice. to bring somebody on, right? right? And then kind of earned a position once they've earned that trust. Or it's been somebody who says, you know, I worked with these guys, the campaigns they put together, or what they did, they are top notch. Almost everybody, I can't think of anybody I've, I've ever hired that didn't come through a connection. And that kind of cold calling, just, hey, here's a resume, you know, like it's, it's really hard compared to somebody who comes in with a, with a, with a great trust, you know, with a, with a recommendation. Yeah, it, it cuts through a lot of clutter, a lot of clutter. Okay, so I got another question for you. Throw it at me. Okay, right, so we were talking about eroding trust. Do you think the trust is going up or down? What are your thoughts? You know, we kind of need to trust people just to function, right? Like we want to, <laughs> so don't part we? Of me, <laughs> right? So I don't know that it's going up or down per se. I think there's just an element of, you know, oh, changing how, how we decide whether we trust things or not, right? There's going to be some brand trust always out there. So I'm going to, I'll think of the hotel space. Like if I'm staying at a Marriott, I'm, I'm, trusting it's going to be a nice room, beds are going to be clean, <laughs> you know, like I, I, they, the brand has done a good job building up trust, right? right like right. I'm not worried, whereas I won't even name other brands, but there are other brands you kind of wonder, ooh, I wonder if the sheets are going to be, you know, plastic or if I'm going to be comfortable, right? So, right, there's a certain amount that, that they've done. At the same time, something like Airbnb has done a wonderful job using the social elements for trust. So when I was, you know, out, uh, I went to Peru, uh, maybe six months ago and it used an Airbnb and it had so many positive recommendations from other people who had stayed there that I was able to have a huge amount of trust that the people who were putting this together were going to do me right. And, you know, it's a little scary sometimes going, you know, we, this was in the middle of the Amazon jungle, this, this particular unit, but I could tell by the positive, uh, you know, comments that were made by people who had actually stayed there that I, I, you know, while it, there's a certain element of danger, right? It was, I was gonna be taken care of. I wasn't just gonna be left alone, right? And so, you know, it can be done, I would say that that's in many ways where it's going, right? That kind of social proof mm. um, is, is a huge part of where a lot of trust, I, 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 where I find whether or not I can trust things or not. But I don't think we're necessarily losing or gaining trust, it's just we're changing where we find it. Oh my God, that's brilliant, right? So I have to ask a question. As a marketer, I feel that I can ask this. And, and as another marketer, I know that you will take it in the right spirit. Sure. And I've been asking this myself. Did we piss in our own pool? I mean, the very people who need to establish trust are the ones eroding it, right? Because it just feels like we keep, I don't know how to say that, right? It's sort of like, I mean, you're a Twitter guy from a long time. I'm a Twitter girl mm -hmm. from a long time. And... Twitter used to be so much fun. You yep. used to build these relationships and know people and so on and so forth. And then the next thing you know, it just gets, you know, there's all this spam and stuff, right? Because people, and the number one question back in the day was, how do I make money on social media? And I'm like, yep. oh my God, that's like totally the wrong question, right? So let's talk a little bit about businesses, marketing, trust and credibility. You know, I'm 100% I'm with you. And I even go a step back sometimes and remember the good old days of blogging, 
right? <laughs> Where when you were running a blog, it was, you know, pre Facebook days, I started being a, quite right. a, as an active blogger. It was your online persona in the way that maybe your Facebook profile or LinkedIn profile is today, right? right. And so I was linking out to friends. You always had a blog role on the side, and these are my kind of connections, and these, this is how I want to be seen and associated with. And it was a blast as a kind of uh, you owning your own kind of connections and, and you know this is who I trust and I think that's why you know there's a bunch of I could go into my whole logic of FCO of why Google loved that but you were really by building these kind of pretty natural connections and then people started you know abusing it for I would say SEO reasons because they realized all these links and this was the way you could go about you know building up your organic search right yes. and you know and Twitter has taken a lot of that but uh, you know, where, where it's done well, or, or Facebook or any of these, is just kind of letting you easily opt out of the noise, right? So if, if there is a lot of people who are spamming me or something, you know, I just unfollow them. I just uh, don't, you know what I mean? Like, I, it's, it's not hard. Right. Um, so I guess what I'm, what I'm thinking is I still try to use Twitter that way. Like, I, I, if I look at somebody's Twitter, or if somebody follows me, Right, and they don't. They've never even replied something to me. They've never done. They've never had a conversation with me. I'm, I'm a little less. I'm a little more skeptical. Somebody who follows me and is having a conversation, I follow back right away. Right, like it's right. oh, this person engages. I, I like it. But if somebody just follows me, I always I should back up and say like one of the ways I like to build trust is I try to find something. If there's somebody going, I want to make a connection with that person. I look through their Twitter feed, try to find something interesting they tweeted out and retweet it or, or and leave a comment or just try to start a conversation. And it gives me a sense of do they respond, do they, how do they do it, and if they don't at all, then I might not even follow them or whatnot. But I'm always like testing, seeing the responsiveness of people because for me, that's how I gauge a lot of credibility, right? Are they going to respond? Is there something there that's, that's behind that. So if I see a new, somebody's followed me and all they have are the last 100 tweets or just a bunch of links, like uh, there's no point necessarily in me following them because it's probably going to be noise. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's different ways you can go about kind of using Twitter to, to continue the conversation. The people are still out there. That's still how I think it's at its best. But in the B2B world, it's hard. Um, probably the only last comment I would make is, I think where a lot of marketers get go wrong is just there's an easy kind of lazy uh, first cut approach, mm. which most people gravitate to, which is here's some cool things. You know, I, I think it, they'll even try to create content that they think their base is their, their community is going to like. Right. But it's a right. constant kind of like here's stuff, here's stuff we think you're going to find interesting. Um, and it's a lot harder to go into a kind of and almost create a community by sharing other people's stuff, unearthing, being that curator. Um, but honestly, I find it a lot more valuable and those are often the, the people with more influence. So, you know, coming in and kind of playing a curation role is, is, a, is an awesome way to not only build trust, but to get those influential people in a community to even engage with you. So I, I would go back and, and say that, how do you kind of be a curator and, you know, create content that's, that's, that is almost naturally shareable Instead of kind of begging people, hey, please share this, or you know, the kind of in-your-face shouting, um, uh, you know, all cap kind of kind of stuff. How do you go out there and create content that that is that people genuinely want to share? And it's it's not trivial. I can give some examples of things that I went, oh, we've tried, you know, 100 things, and 13 of them have worked really well, right? <laughs> and those 13, you go, okay, well, let's try to do more of that, right? Um, and you know, it's, that would be one of the ways I would say you go about it. Is 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 really you know tying it together through that engagement and the kind of almost empathetic use of Twitter. Love that. That's such a great answer. I think that, you know, it, it almost leads me to my next kind of bigger, broader question, which is I've noticed that a lot of small businesses, big brands, small brands, doesn't matter, really, really struggle with that human component. Like they really yeah. don't know how to be online, how to connect with other people. And you do that so well. I mean, I, it never, when, I first started engaging with you through Duns or through the yep. that credibility chat that you had. I was blown away. I'm like, oh my God, they're so easy to talk to. That was the last brand on the planet that I thought would be human. You've done such a great job. Um, what's your well, advice you. to other companies? Well, no, it's it's fun. So, and you know, it's a lot of it is almost. 
you know, I, I like the word empathy in this phrase. And I think if I had to come up with something, there's got to be some way to say like empathetic marketing or something like that, right? Like, I think that at some point that's, it'll, it'll come around to that. Like, how do you put yourself in the shoes of the people that you want to share your message? Um, it is not trivial. It's not um, easy per se, but you know, when, by doing that, you're creating stuff that people ideally, they're going, yeah, that is what I want. That is something useful to me. That is something that's gonna help me improve my business. You know, whatever it is, it's, it's just trying to create kind of empathetic marketing. I think I like that. I've never really used that term, but I might, I might run with that one. You like that, right? Hashtag yeah. empathetic marketing, right? Exactly. Um, Okay, so let's talk. Let's take it one step further. So, what are some things that a small business can do to start engendering that trust to get you know to build trust, get people to trust them more? What are some things that you've seen other people do, or what are your recommendations? So, you know, it's. It, it, I think a lot of it is just you know listening. It starts off with listening. Um, I can think back to the very first campaign I ever tried to run when I created a real estate website. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I did was just, I Googled like crazy, right? Like what are people doing in this market and this site and you know, in, the, in, this, in this space? Um, and what are they doing well? What's getting them to rank? What's getting them, you know, you go to conferences, learn, you know, what, are, what is working for other people um, online, that would be the first place I would start. Like to assume that, you know, I, I, tr I try to assume I know nothing all the time. Like, I feel like I'm almost a better marketer in spots where I know nothing because I can ask the dumb questions and often unearth kind of cool opportunities, right? right. So, so go in and, you know, just, just try to figure out what's working for other people. For me, I've found every time I'm like stuck in a marketing rut of going, what am I gonna do here? I almost always go back to interviewing other people, right? Because it's so, it's, it's just, you learn, it, it, it takes the focus off of you in a way that doesn't you know, um, force you to be the expert. So I was having a conversation, just, I, I, you've kind of alluded, but I was up in Alaska for the past two weeks and went on this awesome trips and was up with this tour guide who took us glacial hiking. And you know, he's a, he was a fellow Berkeley grad. So we had a, a, a good amount going for us. We had a, a, great, a, great, so a lot of great conversations. But he was trying to figure out what he should do. And, I, you know, and he kept saying, I go on these great hikes and I don't know how to get people to care about it because you know, he's, he's a, he seemed like a cool dude to me, but you know, he's not like a sexy girl, like a lot of the travel <laughs> bloggers or, you know, like a different world. Like, you know, he's like, I'm not gonna do selfies all the time. You know, the people I'm taking up don't necessarily want to be in photos on my Instagram. Like he didn't know how to kind of go about it. And so my, my reaction to him was what I would, I do for myself, which is, well, you're, you're around all these such cool people. Cause on the hike, we passed a national park ranger who does backcountry camping out on glaciers and uh, in Wrangell St. Elias. She was, she started telling these stories about things she's seen. I was like, you were around so many great people, just interview them. Like go back to the interview, like bring a little tape recorder. Cause there's no internet up there, right? <laughs> bring a tape recorder and, and, you know, start a podcast. Like you were talking to so many great people. I would love to hear his stories. Right. And, you know, start there. Um, but it doesn't matter for me. Interviews have been awesome. They were some of the first early big wins I had as a blogger. I just sent out to the other bloggers in the space and just said, you know, what works for you? How do you, whether it be you're selling houses or you do your marketing and, you know, come up with good questions. Um, whether it be, you know, hang Google Hangouts like we're doing, it could be, you know, podcast style interviews over Skype, it could be webinars you're doing where you're bringing other people in, anything you can do like that. I think that that's just such a great way to kind of build some trust in that, you know, you are really providing a good resource for your community and, and, and try to think outside the box. Like I said, the one guy didn't, you know, the great smart, he was a Berkeley graduate. I gotta say, he, he's gotta be somewhat smart. I was, he went to Berkeley, there's a lot of smart kids there, right? <laughs> yeah. right. So, but he didn't, he didn't necessarily make that kind of marketer's leap of how do, I, how do I do something that others are gonna find interesting. That's awesome. So I gotta ask you a fun question. Uh, which is what famous people living or dead most epitomize trust for you? Like, you know, this is, yes, yeah, this is a hard one. I um, know. I, 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 gosh, I did a podcast recently and somebody else came back and talked about the, um, the Abraham Lincoln book that you can't help but just utterly fall in love with. It was a, 
uh, Band of Brothers, I believe it's called. Mm. I think that's the name of the title of the book. It's it's huge. I, I listen to the audio book, so I want to say how big the book is because I've seen it on shelves. But I listened to it for I think it was forty four hours or something, right? And just was so it just so emerged. I just couldn't put it down. Whole weekends were lost for me of you know sixteen hours just trying to get through this book. But it was fascinating to to really understand how Lincoln thought about leadership and and built that trust. Um, it, it was so phenomenal. So I can't help but want to go back there. And you know, it's a it's it, to him. Uh, it's probably you know super iconic, right? Or super super generic, but just a, you know, it would be a common thing. I would I would guess. But for me, the way that he brought others in, and even you know, if he saw someone was smart and he let them have th their point of view, um, became such an important part of um, you know. The, the the almost the authority and the power and and the way he distributed his power and he ruled he kind of I say ruled in a very you know but but in the way that he was able to do it through leadership was was really amazing I, I was I was utterly blown away so I guess that's where that word that would come in is leadership if you're talking people right and, and leaders uh, that, how do they build that trust and, and people really want to uh, you know I, I'm so glad you said that because on the tweet chat Barbara Kimmel actually said. It's leadership that needs to consider its business. It's all about leadership. So shout out to you, Barbara. <laughs> and your Barbara, awesome yes. Tweet, right? So I just tweeted out, I, if you take a look at Twitter, I t tweeted out a picture of my most awesome Canon Maxify printer with all kinds of hearts and flowers. So um, I wanted to thank them again. They are talking about um, trust and credibility. Um, they're such a great brand for that. You know what's really interesting? So this is something that I did. Uh, because I'm such a stickler for trust. I went to New York City because Canon was having an event and they did not pay for me to go. They did give me a ticket to the event because it was for Canon people only. And yeah. I was like, oh, it's probably going to be this small thing. Here it was in the entire Jacob Javits Center, like all of it, like wow. every square inch. And it was not a show. It was like, a, like an artist's exhibit. It was like an installation, not a show. Yep. And I have to admit that one of the reasons I went was to see if what I was told and what I was experiencing for the Canon campaign was actually so on the court. And I have to say, very, very consistent. Very, very consistent. So shout out to our friends at Canon, who I love. Okay. Very cool. So what are some things that you've seen marketing people do that cause people not to to trust them, Dustin? Um, you know, I, I alluded to some things earlier, which, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick to the kind of social online world here, because mm -hmm. marketing is so broad, right? But I'm thinking, you know, on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, what are some things that I've seen that, you know, small businesses go out? Um, and it's either, you know, uh, like I said, like not engaging at all, that, that's not a particularly uh, it doesn't doesn't build a lot of trust in my mind. Um, if people are out there, you know, engaging and replying, even negative stuff. I mean, companies have people, you know, uh, big companies in particular. There's lots of interactions every day. You know, people mess up. There's genuine mistakes. There's stupid mistakes. Things happen. But you know, are they responsive? Are they taking care of it? That's that's more that what matters to me than than anything else. Are they? You know, and and. I've uh, I told a story once that I, I really like about actually my boss, which was I was really new um, in here and we were a startup. This is before Dun & Bradstreet bought our company. Mm -hmm. And so she's the CMO of, of this startup and we had, we had an issue. And somebody on Twitter was not happy about something that was, that was happening in their, their product. And it, it blew my boss's mind. She's like, that shouldn't happen. They're like, this is what, we have a process in place. Like, what broke down? Like, where did it go wrong? Because she just didn't, you know, like, but it came through Twitter. The guy had tweeted something out. Right. So, you know, she got on the phone with the guy, talks to him for maybe 15, 20 minutes, then gets on the, calls in other uh, customer support, calls in everybody, and, you know, nailed that problem and nipped it in the bud. So it would never happen again. Right, like stuff is going to go wrong. You could put the greatest systems in place, people don't show up to work that day, or something goes wrong. Right, like you can't, you know, the unexpected is 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 got to be built into your process, and, and you have to have be, be willing to accommodate that. Right, but what's critical is that, that people are really stepping up and dealing with those things. So if I see that online, that's where I see the trust. The lack of trust is 
stuff's going wrong and, and no one's paying attention. Um, that, that always seems negative to me. Um, and you could get back to what we talked about, Dun & Bradstreet files and that kind of stuff. Like the, the, if somebody's looking at uh, your business credit or any your personal credit, you know, if you're not paying attention to your own business, um, that, and it's obvious when someone pulls a report on you, that would be a negative. Um, you know, but there's so many different elements to go. I don't necessarily know why I even brought it back to DMB other than it seems like all these connections you can make between our conversation, they all kind of come back to, you know, similar themes. Oh, exactly. And you've actually, and I've actually just put up the other question that you sort of answered right in that because you're such a great straight man. The question was, if a small business marketer can do one thing, what would that be? And so the answer clearly is participate, like respond to people. I really yeah. love that. Oh, and Julie says, Jay Bear says, hug your haters. I love that. <laughs> and Barbara Kimmel says she is just coming out with some awesome stuff. And now, of course, if I can get it to show up on, stop moving. It's moving. That's funny. I, it I is. It's like, moving. Hi, I want to say that I will get active on Twitter, but on this, I'm just like looking at you. Dude, I know. I know. But I, if I'm not tweeting very much, it'll change after we get a little thing. But I, I, I'm not, I feel like I'm, I'm failing on Twitter right you're now. You're not failing on Twitter. I'm you're doing trying not great. to multitask too much. I know. I'm only multitasking because I have to. But I love what Barbara Kimmel says, high self-orientation is the biggest trust buster. So if you're constantly being focused on yourself, if you're constantly just worried about how it impacts you, definitely not going to work. I'm with you, Barbara. And uh, Sean Miller says, uh, in response to the question, let me see what question he was responding to. Uh, the list is too long, he says. And I think the question was, what are things that you see marketers do to cause people not to trust them? And Sean says mm -hmm. the list is entirely too long. And that we can definitely go towards high self-orientation and just being more focused on, I don't want to say, don't get me wrong. I don't want to say that money's not important and making sales aren't important and all that stuff. But somehow when it's focused on you, Mm -hmm. And what you can get out of it, small business owners don't want that. I don't think they want that. No. And, yeah. and they want to, yeah, you want to do business with people you like, you know, you want to, you want to engage with people you like, you want to, it, it's just, it's a reality. Exactly. Exactly. So I have to get, I wanted to, I wanted to put this question out there mainly because I want to share a story. And I don't know if you've seen this, but I've actually experienced this, experienced this for myself. I'm totally like going off script. Eva's going to just shoot me dead. Um, it's all good. The question was, what brands do you trust most and why? Do you have brands that you trust? I definitely do. Um, you know, I mentioned a few earlier, maybe because I just, I do live a very online life <laughs> and I put a lot of trust in those. My mind is, is revolving around you know, the brands like the Amazon or the Airbnb that have built in the kind of social proof around the purchase. Um, that's where my, that's where I go initially, but um, you know, there's tons of great brands. I've been, a, for, for better or worse, I've been an, a loyal Apple guy and I know a lot of our developers, it makes them scratch their heads. They're like, Android's got so much more flexibility and freedom and everything else. But you know, I think a lot of that has to do with the brand that I know what I'm gonna get, I know it's gonna work, I know it's gonna sync and yeah, I'm probably gonna pay a little bit more, but you know, when I get home and all my files are backed up and you know, everything's working just like I wanted to without you know, me having to spend a lot of time managing it, that's worth right. a lot, and and I think Apple's done, you know, a good job simplifying it. Um, so you know, there's but the brands that I trust, I, there's there's so many of them out there. It's hard for me to, to you know, kind of one. I'm going which ones? Almost which ones do I not trust? I wouldn't even want to say. But you know, there's there's just a lot of good. You know, even even brands that don't necessarily have, let's say, the highest level of service. Um, so a good company. I shouldn't. The service is a funny way to say that. Like I really like Southwest, but I know right. I'm not going to get the you know gold plated service when I go there, right? Correct. <laughs> it, Correct. right? But, but I know it's going to be consistent. I know what I'm, I'm expecting. They're, they're friendly. Um, you know, they make up for maybe not having you know the the 
business class or first class, you know, elements to it. But, you know, I, I'll travel them all around uh, because I know what I'm going to get and, and they always deliver with a smile and, you know, they're going to respond if I'm going to have a, a, a real issue. Correct. Correct. All right. So that brings me to another question. Oh, no, we already did that one. Uh -huh. <laughs> Am I bouncing oh. around too much here? No, not at all. Uh, I don't know if we talked about this. You know, we talked about what brands can do to engender trust. Now, what are some things that a brand or a company could do to cause you to lose trust? I think, you know, like we said, uh, some of these things before, um, there are, you know, I don't necessarily distrust a company because they don't tweet, let's say, right? Right. But I right. distrust it when they do it really bad or, um, <laughs> Right, if they're they're messing stuff up, but I'm trying to think of just, gosh, what what? Okay, what are things that they so would do to make you? It's hard. I don't necessarily have a good answer here. I know. Um, I'm not sure that I do either. I asked that out into the Twitter sphere, so I'm hoping I'm sure that folks will uh, respond with some, a lot of their a lot of their feedback. Right? Yeah, uh, give us some ideas for what they can do. I mean, there are great examples. You know, of I'll search them sometimes when I'm just writing. Like, where do people mess up? <laughs> where brands really messed up on some social tool or in a marketing campaign? Um, you know, I don't really view it as my job. I try my best not to badmouth other companies, right? But they're the fun examples you see. Like X Y Z did this. How was that so insensitive? Right. Or you know, whereas well, a company that maybe goes out on a limb and does something that's, you know, uh, maybe a little controversial, but something I agree with politically, like, I might go, gosh, I really like that. Like, that's going to help build trust in that brand. That's um, what it is. I think the things that a brand would do, so I don't want to talk about any particular brand. I'm not even sure I have one in mind, mm -hmm. which I don't. Uh, but the thing that I tip, that, that would make me lose trust in a brand would be something like, you say one thing in your marketing and then you behave a completely different kind of way. Yep. Right? I actually have examples of two brands. I have one example, which is really interesting, right? Now, you'll love this. So, I, um, and I'm going to tell, say who it is because they have, I think they're going to help other small businesses like realize that a bad thing can actually work in your favor. Right? So, I was working with SiteLock. So imagine my surprise. I have SiteLock through, who's my hosting? Bluehost. I have SiteLock through Bluehost, right? Like, you, like, you know, you choose your old packages yep. and whatever. And somehow, I don't even know how, I find out that my site got hacked. I'm like, what the hell? What happened? Yep. I'm like, how could it get hacked? I have this thing. So I'm like, oh, you just didn't read the instructions correctly. So I go, no, looks like I did. So I tweet out to SiteLock. Yep. They respond, Dustin, like immediately. They called me on Easter <laughs> to fix this problem, right? So that's my point. So on the one hand, I had one impression of the company. It was upset and was fit to be tied. But who they were online and how they responded to me mm -hmm. changed everything. And when you, you talk know, to every single person, you can see that they're really, really committed to getting it right. No, you're exactly right. You had me thinking for some reason of a funny story when I was a blog, not funny, but an interesting twist on it maybe. When I was a, a first starting blogging, um, somebody, I, I used to look at my search logs all the time to see what people were landing on my site. I was really curious. So somebody had said like, oh, you know, why shouldn't I move to Seattle? And I was running a Seattle real estate blog at the time. Hmm. And I was like, that's really odd. And I thought, you mentioned that like taking a negative to a positive. So I wrote a, a blog post that said 10 reasons you should not move to Seattle. Right? <laughs> and, you know, and it was, it was a little, of course, tongue in cheek. And, you know, you got to talk about the rain. And, you know, for me, it was had been an L.A. kid. It was the bad Mexican food and some <laughs> other things that I, I didn't necessarily, you know, didn't, didn't agree with me in the Seattle lifestyle. And so I, I, I wrote the blog post up and it just blew up. It became the most blo popular blog post I think I've ever written. Um, and it was, it went all over the place and you know, it actually brought in at the time I was doing referrals and real estate stuff, it brought in more business than everything else. And I think it's got like 900 comments these days. And you know, like it's just, it's one of those things that just, you know, was, it was worked. Right. 
And so at some levels, you know, if you can take that negative, right, and spin it and go, yeah, it's not perfect, right? But, you know, within the context of the answers I was given, like, here's the negative, but I would almost always even say, like, here's a way to get around it. Like, this is what you got to do to, to kind of, you know, it's a negative, but here's, here's, a, here's the, you know, a positive that makes up for it. Exactly. You can do that kind of stuff. You, you, it can be a great way to build the trust, the credibility, everything else that, that goes along with it. So I don't know that I have a great, kind of waiting to, you know, like, take it from there. But but it's those stories of how do you take a negative and, you know, make it something positive. Uh, no, ab absolutely. You know, and, and, and I guess the message I want to give to folks, if it isn't clear, is that I think we overthink it sometimes, especially a business that like we think we have to look a certain way or we have to be a certain way. And Every story that we've talked about so far is that being a transparent human being and dealing with what's so mm -hmm. works every time. Yep. Right. So I have another question. Is there a difference between what a brand does to lose trust and what a person does to lose trust? Because we all talked about relationships and human relationships. And you know, we're a brand in a big company or even a medium small company, a company versus a person. What do you think? Is there a difference? Not necessarily. Um, you know, the trust is, I, I almost want to like try to get philosophical and I'm not sure I'm, I'm totally, my, I've wrapped my head around this one, right? But trust is something that is like given to a person or to a brand. It's not something you like have, right? So, uh, you know, if, if whether somebody trusts you or your company or anything, it's what they are doing to you, right? Um, and so, you know, I think that the same, you know, the same way that a brand could mess up is because those other people don't trust you and they're telling other people, right? And, and that's where, as a company, you don't want it to escalate. Like, if you are a very small business and, you know, you've got three clients that you work with and you lose trust with them, you might just blow 30 30, 50% of your business or something, right? Like right, it right. can be a huge job, one thing. You're, that wouldn't necessarily happen to a company per se, a big company, or you know, it's gonna lose maybe one customer and if they've got thousands, you could say, oh, does it really matter? But if they've got a voice and they're sharing and other people are sharing that negative experience, that would be a really bad thing, right? So, but it's, it's I, I, I'm kind of wanna say it's, it's how others are viewing you um, is in my mind is, is where that trust comes from. So it almost brings us back to our first question, right? What's the difference between trust and credibility? And you just said trust is earned, and I think that's so true. And mm -hmm. trust is earned because of your consistent behavior. Exactly, right? exactly. Right? Being who you are, being authentic, being open, being okay with mistakes, mm -hmm. right? And just earning it that way. Um, what else did I want to ask you? What didn't I ask that? I mean, that's. I mean, let's just talk about. I want. I want to kind of wrap it up by talking about sure. Dun and Bradstreet a little bit. Um, you know, growing up, probably in the '80s when I first came into Dun and Bradstreet, being exposed to it, just like you were through purchasing yep. and so on and so forth, it just seemed like this entity out there. And um, how did you guys finally get to the message of we're all about trust and credibility? And talk a little bit about that story. <laughs> well, I, I would start by saying I feel like that's like way above my pay grade here. Like really? people doing that great jobs. You know, I'm I'm we've got CMOs and CEOs and you know other people who really set the tone. Um, so uh, I don't I can't in any way claim like oh this is how. You know, I was able to even, I don't even, oh, no. you know. I, I mean, I'm just the, saying as a brand, I'm really, really impressed with that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and uh, it's quick responses. It's being actively engaged. It's not just online either. You know, one of the things I really like about my team is, so I run the engagement team, really focused, as I said, on the small to medium-sized businesses. And, you know, that engagement team includes active, it includes events. We exhibit, we speak at, we sponsor, you know, lots of events, maybe 40, 50 a year around the country. Um, and so I've got, you know, a group of people that travel all the time to events and I go to events. That's actually what brought me to Alaska last, you know, a couple weeks ago. So I 
find it speaking to those people, getting out, hearing, you know, complaints, hearing kudos, people, how they leverage it in new ways. Like I learned so much engagement, not just online, because I, I also have a social media team and a content team reporting in its engagement team. But you know, there, there's so much of just that personal interaction and getting out and listening and not kind of closing yourself off. Um, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to speak, for, like I said, for all of DMB, right? But I can tell you, having somebody in on the inside, they that is a core piece of what people are trying to do, which is just listen and you know. And I don't, I, I wasn't around. Let's say if, if you remember how you're remembering things in the, the 80s or 90s or 2000s, like I don't, I wasn't there. I can't tell you what it was like. It might have been, <laughs> they might have been the same logic or whatnot. But I can tell you today, that is a big part of of what people are doing. I think I think it's wonderful and I and I think that whatever it is that you guys have been doing has absolutely been working because mm -hmm. um, yeah everything you know like when you and I were talking about in fact let's let's wrap up with some real practical things right like um, like you guys just sharing those links about where to get more information and to yeah. looking up into your Duns number and those kinds of things so it sounds like um, your role is really to help educate small business owners on like for what sure. credit means so, and all that stuff. How to get bigger, better jobs, how to work your way up and grow Yeah, exactly. Business. And you know, that's something that I'm passionate about. It's why I go to those events. It's why I love this kind of world, right? And and seeing kind of the eyes open up of business owners when they go, Oh, that makes sense. You know, I'll be I was at an event and I feel like I can name drop these guys because they they name drop it themselves all the time. So, you know, I was at a, an event in San Diego, a Navy small business contracting event and Raytheon was there, right? And the Raytheon guy, you know, the, they, when small businesses come up to them and say, I wanted to work with you, their guy, and I've met him now multiple years in a row at this, this uh, different events, you know, he'll say, well, go talk to the Dun & Bradstreet for folks first and look at your service score because if you, if your supplier evaluation risk rating isn't, good enough like don't bother applying to us until you get you get that score you know under control so he they are you know very actively there are they're our best lead to be quite honest with you. people come over and they're going Raytheon said I got to look at it and then we start talking they're going oh I see how this stuff matters right so you know yes we love being that educational resource because quite honestly that's the number one thing I think in the small to medium sized space is just almost a, a don't totally understand how business credit is used whether it be you know within the lending space within the contracting space uh, within suppliers and manufacturing it is it's that that DMV file is is used in so many different ways so with that said I, I will happily make a plug because I'm, I'm actually really proud of it so a couple of weeks ago, we launched a new site on DNB, that b2b.dnb.com, and we've just been throwing resources up there. So we've been taking stuff that honestly was in a few different locations, few different on the website, and it, we just used this new site as an opportunity to bring stuff together, really update our marketing, update our educational resources available. So we had put uh, our team, not I say we in the, the global we, <laughs> had put together some great videos around what is a DUNS, how is it used, how do you get you know loans out of it, how is it, how is it updated, all that kind of stuff, and a whole series of, of videos, all those are sitting on there. So if anyone's interested, you go to the b2b.dmb.com, you'll see a, a little tag on there that's business credit. If they go there, they've got uh, all kinds of resources, and you know this is only a few weeks old. This page, it, those, all the pages, the whole site is only a few weeks old. So you know we're just adding lots and lots of good stuff, and and it really I like to think a helpful way for small business owners, and that's got to be one of those resources. You know, I, I feel like a geek saying it, but I'm really excited. It's fun to go somewhere, right? And it's also fun because I do have that kind of blogger background, and I still, as much as I might say, like the SEO world kind of, um, you know, screwed with blogging on a lot of levels because people started blogging just for SEO, and that became right. the business element. Um, I can't help but 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 love that the site starts getting picked up by Google really fast, and these these pages are ranking, you know. And it's like so, you know, I, the SEO in me really loves that, that that you know you can see that the resources are good. People are landing on the page, they're staying, they're watching the videos, you know, they're they're signing up for newsletters that that get them more information, all that kind of stuff. So I love that the site is doing what we wanted it to do. That's all you can ask for. 
All right, so we are we are gonna wrap up this video portion. I wanna make sure I give you time to jump up on Twitter and we're still gonna be tweeting about this probably for the next few minutes. I wanted to thank you, Dustin Luther. No, uh, it's wonderful. I will tell you people who are watching, Dustin is one of the most responsive folks. You tweet to him, he will tweet back. <laughs> You know, he has to. It's his job. But no, he really well, does. And I've, got a, I've got an easy Twitter handle, so I'm just at tier. But you'll see I have another woman here. I almost want to like... Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, Give her the kudos. Let us see yeah, her. So, you know, Jenny here who works with me and, and runs our social media team, she's been tweeting it up at the D&B B2B. So just at D&B B2B. If you haven't seen that in the... Um, in the hashtag, the, the chat hashtag, that kind of stuff. It, I'm, look for it. She's there and is awesome and, and doing a wonderful job. But and I really will join on in a little bit. I, you know, I, I like to think I like to focus, if nothing else. So I've been happy just to focus on this this wonderful conversation. Yeah. But uh, I love Twitter and we'll bounce on there and answer questions or you know make connections. And if people have cool ideas, they want to you know, write content, they think they have content ideas, or they want to join a podcast we do, or, you know, anything like that, please, I'm, I really am super easy to reach out to. And the only time I don't respond quickly is when I'm doing things like taking a week off in Alaska and totally That's right. out of the loop. <laughs> That's right. So I'm really excited, Dustin, because, uh, well, of course, next week is 4th of July, so we'll be off, because we'll all be celebrating freedom yes. and independence by not being online. I make a, I'm going to make a big attempt to not be online that day. Uh, but next week, guess who's going to be my guest? Do you know Diana Adams, Adams Consulting? I have heard of her, yes. I don't She's, know her well. Well, her, she and Rebecca Raddis uh, run the social engagement for Post Planner. And so I know Rebecca Raddis, actually, because... She was doing real estate stuff back when I was doing real estate stuff. And I don't even totally remember where, but I've actually been chatting with her recently on different oh, things. Oh, she's so, wonderful. Yeah. Well, she and Diana are the one-two punch behind Post Planner. They do a ton of content there, but uh, they're going to be my guest on July. I mean, Diana is going to be my guest on July 11th uh, because uh, she has an amazing way of engaging people and communities that just really mimic that brand. So it's kind of a takeoff of today's conversation. So mm -hmm. if you're open, you can follow along on the chat. We'd love to have you. And I want to thank, of course, Canon Maxify line of printers for sponsoring today's chat and Barbara Kimmel for being there as well as our friend Julie Zisman. Of course. Hi, Julie. She's been tweeting along, sweetie pie that she is. And all the folks, of course, Dun & Bradstreet and Jennifer and everyone else that's going to be tweeting along as the conversation continues. Dustin, thank you so much nice. for taking this time after your vacation. Well, thank you so much. I look forward to uh, staying connected here. Absolutely, always. And we'll find Dustin on Twitter at T-Y-R, Tier. It's a game name, isn't it? It was a, he's the Nordic God. And I used to use it because when I signed up for Twitter, I thought it was I didn't, I didn't, I wanted to be anonymous. I didn't know what the service was. It was pretty early. It was new. And I thought, I don't want people to know who I am yet, right? I just didn't know what Twitter was. So I did this thing that I used to use for games. And all of a sudden I got known by this little three letter Twitter handle and I, I can't give it up. So I can't give it up. I get it. Cause when I joined, you were supposed to use, I, my original one was strategies too. Cause you were supposed to use your blog name. And so then I did the DIY marketers one. I have even a Taylor, but I don't use it. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so shout out to Molly Hart, who's also here. Thanks for being here, Molly, and your awesome input. We are going to sign off for the day. We're going to keep chatting on Twitter. Dustin, thank you so much. Have an awesome week. You too. Thanks a bunch.